Okay, this is the lecture for Para 104 in week 11, and we're going to be talking about stress and stress how it applies to paramedics specifically. It's an area I'm particularly interested in. It's an area I have experience in. I think I've mentioned this in class, but uh, after about 14 years working with Toronto Ambulance when the SARS academic, academic SARS epidemic hit, uh, I was off for a year with post-traumatic stress order, diagnosis post-traumatic stress order on workers' compensation. And then uh, when I eventually got back into work and stuff, I because this is how I am, I decided to take a master's degree in counseling psychology. And when I graduated from that, I was doing a little bit of stress counseling for emergency services personnel. So I've got some experience in this area personally as a paramedic, as somebody who has PTSD and somebody who has subsequent master's degree in the area. Uh, so take it for what it's worth, but that's my academic uh, background for all of this. So this is what we're going to talk about in this lecture. We'll probably divide up over, I, I would guess, about three parts. We're going to talk about what stress is, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between normal stress and abnormal stress, because some stress is good, some stress is bad. We're going to talk then about how that affects us, more from a physiological point of view, and then, probably this will be part two, talk a little bit about uh, the specifics of how stress affects paramedics in our job and in the role that we do, and a little bit about how to process what we experience as paramedics, because we see some terrible things and some poignant, sad things. So what do we do with those? You know, there's not a lot of really good role models in our culture about uh, what to do when things really hit you. You know, so we'll talk a little bit about that and some evidence based strategies for dealing with the flashbacks and the stuff that comes up when you're off duty and you start thinking about all the sad things or the gruesome things. We'll talk a little bit about acute stress disorder and post traumatic stress disorder, which are two diagnoses that can be made when stress uh, becomes overwhelming for us. And we'll help you to recognize when you've got that. So we'll come up with a bit of a checklist for you guys that you can print and put up on your fridge or whatever uh, so that you can keep in mind if I'm experiencing these things, maybe it's time to get some help or, or take this more seriously than myself or just address it somehow. Then we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how we can care for ourselves if we've been injured by stress. And it really is an injury, just like if someone punched you in the arm and you got a bruise. It's, it's an emotional injury. And then we'll talk a little bit about the options uh, for getting professional help and what that might look like. So let's start off with stressors and stress. So if I say to you, could you please do this? Then I have become uh, a stressor because I am forcing you to respond to that in some way. If you're a little bacteria in a Petri dish and we put in an irritating chemical and the bacteria moves away from it, then that's a stressor. So if something demands a response from us, that's a stressor. And the subjective feeling that we have, that we have to respond to it, that's stress. So when we say stress, normally people think, you know, like the picture here, <gasps> stress, it's terrible. But uh, if someone says, hey, come over here, I want to give you a million bucks, technically that's a stressor too. It's a pretty good stressor. It's a positive stressor. Or they could say, you know, come here because I want to shoot you in the head. That's a pretty negative stressor. So stressors can be good or bad. Stress itself isn't inherently a bad thing. The thing about that sensation of stress is, as well is that it can, it can add up. It's cumulative. So a lot of little stressors start to take on the appearance of the same as a great big stressor. Uh, and stress, the positive and negatives, they don't necessarily balance each other out. And the example here is winning the lottery doesn't cancel the effect of hearing that someone you really love died. And also stresses are very specific. So what might be uh, a large stressor for you might be a very small stressor for me. I have an absolutely pathological absence of stage fright. You could put me up in front of a million people and, you know, ask me to explain something that I only partially understand. And I'll say, yeah, sure, I'll give it a try. I wouldn't be afraid. I might realize I'm not going to do a great job, but I wouldn't have this feeling like, oh my God, I can't go in front of all those other people. On the other hand, slide me into an MRI machine and I go crazy. I'm just claustrophobic. I I can't do that. They had to completely sedate me to put me in an MRI machine. Other people I know went into an MRI machine and thought it was just kind of boring, you know, or a little interesting or whatever, but had absolutely no subjective sense of stress from it. So what is a stressor for one person or a large stressor for one person uh, could be a very small one for somebody else. So stress 
as opposed to a stressor, is the feeling of arousal that we get in response to the stressor. So uh, the, the amount of stress that I would subjectively feel about public speaking is small. The amount of stress that I would subjectively feel about going an MRI is huge. And uh, a guy named Hans Selye, Selye, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his name because I've never heard anybody else really say it. I've just read about it a lot. Um, he was the guy who first came up with this uh, thing called the general adaptation syndrome. And what he said is that we go through phases in response to stress. So when a stressor impinges on us, we go through a predictable phase of how we're going to respond to that stressor. And that's what he called the general adaptation syndrome. So here's a diagram of it that I stole from somewhere on the internet, not exactly sure where. And I'm going to explain this diagram in terms of you being a paramedic <clears throat> and how you would feel what's going on. So in the green zone, uh, let's just say you're sitting in the station and you're waiting for a call to come in. You've got a little bit of stress because there is a stressor being placed on you. Can you imagine what the stressor is? The stressor is your work obligation that you have to be sitting in the station. So you've responded to that stressor by showing up and going to work. Even on days where you'd rather not, the stressor has enough energy that it causes you enough stress that it motivates you to get out and put on your uniform and sit in the station. But it's not a lot. I mean, we're not really worried, you know. So let's say the next thing that happens is the uh, phone rings or the pager goes off or however you're notified, and you get the call that... Um, there's been a mass shooting. There's 50 confirmed deaths, hundreds of casualties. You're going in, and we, for just about every paramedic, that would be a oh my god situation, you know, of wow, this is really overwhelming. So we go into a bit of an onset or of, of shock, of you know, yikes, and our adrenaline goes up, and we start to get ready for this uh, challenge that we're about to face. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be anything terrible. It could just be, you know, a uh, motor vehicle accident, it's raining outside, or, or a pediatric call, or just something that makes you go, ugh. And we have this uh, sort of a momentary uh, arousal in order to, to um, mount a challenge to that response. So we go out, we do the call. And then we do another one, then we do another one, then we do another call, we do another call, and eventually you get to the point, and for rookies it might not seem like this will ever happen, but you get to the point where a call comes in, it's a cardiac arrest, and you think, oh, okay, and off you go. You're not thinking, wow, cardiac arrest, wow, I hope I do it right. You've, you've done hundreds, and you're pretty resistant to that stress. So this is phase three of, you know, a resistance phase, and what would be very, very stressful for other people isn't terribly stressful for you. You're like, yeah, okay, I can go run a cardiac arrest as a paramedic. It's pretty, you know, that's what I do. Uh, but let's say you get a lot of pediatric calls and a lot of mass trauma calls and burn patients and all the ugly, terrible calls that are really stressors for you. And you just keep getting one after the other after the other. Eventually, you, you won't be able to resist the amount of stress, the amount of arousal that arises in, within us because of all the, the heavy stressors that are being pushed on us. At that point, we start to decompensate and we start to go down. And interestingly, if you think about it, this is a lot like how patients respond when, you know, initially they're okay, their vitals are normal, and then something happens to them and, and uh, maybe there's a bit of a dip and then their vitals go up and up and up. You get tachycardic, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe a little hypertensive and all the sort of stuff. And then, you know, the tachypnea starts falling into bradypnea, the blood pressure starts dropping, the SATs start dropping, CO2 goes up. Everything starts to sort of drop off and they fall off the cliff. And that's how we do when we're dealing with stress. So let's talk about the difference between normal and abnormal stress. The term scientists use for normal or good stress is eustress. Eu means healthy or normal. So um, eupnea means normal breathing. Eurythmia means good rhythm. And the Eurythmics, which was a great 80s band, had a great name. It meant good rhythm. So you stress is just good stress. And that's the sort of stuff that challenges us. It helps us to grow. It gives us energy. It gives us a sense of vitality, often a sense of purpose. You know, the alarm goes off. You got to get up to work. And although it's also very frustrating, there's also a sense of, yeah, okay, let's get up. I got something to do. That's good stress. Distress is the type of stress that overwhelms us. It's too much. Everybody feels this by the end of the semester. They're all gone from eustress into distress. And it starts to uh, take energy out of us. It starts to make us feel like we're getting drained or wiped out. 
critical incident stress is at the point where we are really beginning to fail in our ability to cope with those stressors. So the stress, the sense of anxiety and arousal that we're experiencing is too much for us to deal with. And that starts getting into areas of acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. So critical incident stress isn't a technical definition. It's a bit of an overall term for us going too far into that final phase of the general adaptation syndrome where we're now no longer coping with it. As you can imagine, this has a very strong effect on us. <clears throat> so you can imagine that eustress has a pretty beneficial effect, picks us up in distress, and critical incident stress really starts to wipe us out. Let's talk about why that is. Let's talk about what it does inside your brain. For this, I'm going to use an analogy I came up with a little while ago. I'd like you to imagine that you're sitting in a car. As an observer, you're not like physically there, but you're able to see into a car. And the person driving the car is a girl named Amy. And Amy is just one of these uh, fantastically excitable people that everything freaks her out while she's driving, like the, the quintessential scaredy pants driver, where as she's driving along, she hears a you know, a pebble pop under the wheel and she's like, ah, what's that? What's that? And just freaks out every time something goes on. So imagine watching Amy driving the car. Obviously, Amy wouldn't be able to cope very well. So in order to balance Amy out, what we've done, just go with me here, is we've put a hippopotamus into the back seat. And the hippo has a really fantastic memory. And the hippo is able to be extremely calming to Amy. So when the wheels pop or something hits the windshield or uh, you know a light goes or something and Amy just freaks out, <clears throat> the hippopotamus leans forward and says, don't worry Amy, it's okay, it's just a normal stoplight. You just have to stop, everything's fine, it's all good, it's all all right. And Amy, who's hyper excitable and freaks out, <clears throat> is calmed down by this hippo, which has a great memory of everything that's happened and knows what things are. And is able to calm Amy down. So the hippo was a really good sort of break on Amy's excitability and sympathetic overdrive. Unfortunately, nobody in there is really good at figuring out where to drive or how to get the directions or, you know, they need a navigator. You need someone who can do the thinking. So beside Amy in the front seat is another character, and that character is a scientist. So think of however you want to think of a scientist. Typically, you know, a <clears throat> some older person uh, sitting in a lab coat, frizzy hair, you know, think of uh, Doc from Back to the Future, whoever, you, no, Doc's too excitable. <laughs> Somebody who's sort of calm and who is able to say, oh, we need to turn left here, we need to turn right there. You know what, this place is 600 kilometers away and we've only got enough gas left for like uh, 300 kilometers. So let's start looking for a gas station soon. And they sort of do the executive reasoning and the executive thinking. <clears throat> so you can imagine that if we want to get this car going, there's three characters. There's Amy, there's the hippo, and there's the scientist. And if that seems really weird, now I'll explain what I mean by that. In our brain, we have three um, uh, parts of our brain that have different functions. The amygdala is wired to recognize threat. So when you're, uh, you know, classic example, you're walking into your garage or something and you look down the ground and you go, oh, a snake, there's a snake. That instant sort of oh, reaction that you get is your amygdala. Your amygdala triggers that. <clears throat> and uh, if someone then turns on the light and you see that it's a rope, your hippocampus is the thing that goes, no, no, calm down. It's all right. It's just a rope. And you're still going, ooh, 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 because Amy's still all freaked out. But the hippocampus is calming the amygdala down and telling them ropes aren't dangerous, ropes aren't venomous, we don't have to worry about a rope, uh, so it's okay. And then the frontal lobe, the cerebral cortex, the so the upper part of our brain, so the cerebral cortex is up here, the um, amygdala and the hippocampus are down sort of mid-brainish area above the brainstem, <clears throat> in the limbic system. So the scientist at that point would probably say something like, oh, you know, we should probably pick up the rope and put it away. And you know what, maybe while we're here, we should just take a look if there are any snakes, just in case. So the three systems sort of work together well. And if, if you've ever done paramedic training, when you guys do your OSCE and, you know, when you're going through 
calls and stuff like that, you'll have this sensation of the amygdala being triggered and you being kind of freaked out. And this feeling that you have, just calm down, calm down, calm down. A lot of that will be coming from the hippocampus. So if you're ready to go into, for example, a test, part of what you'll be thinking about is, look, I'm not actually in danger here. Even if you're not consciously thinking that, you're just going, because you know it, it actually is okay. So those three systems kind of work well together. Let's take a look at how they work. So the amygdala is the stress evaluator. It is a hair trigger of uh, a recognition of danger. So it's the amygdala that goes, ah! when you do that, ah! that's your amygdala doing that. It clicks in and says, we're in danger here. And then the amygdala consults with the rest of the brain to sort of see, uh, is this really a problem? Let's check with the hippocampus and see what the hippo has to say. Let's, if we can, get the scientists coming in here to give us their evaluation of the situation. So when something that's really actually traumatic for us uh, occurs, the amygdala sends out danger signals, initiates our sympathetic nervous system and the fight or flight response that we get that Ugh, panic, and it will store strong stimuli. It will store strong associations as well so that we can more quickly and instantly recognize dangers. So for example, if you were, I don't know, attacked by a dog as a kid, um, that will process in your amygdala as a real danger, as something that you need to be careful of. And when you see dogs in the future, you are much more likely to get the Ugh! sort of reaction than somebody who had a beautiful dog that they loved as a kid. The amygdalas are programmed, amygdalae, because there's two, they're programmed in a different way uh, because of that prior experience. And when there's no longer any danger, the amygdala can help in that calming process. So after a critical incident stress, what are we going to have? Like a really big stress on us? We're going to have anxiety. We're going to have a sense of hypervigilance. Being vigilant means you're staying aware. So we're like super aware. We're on guard. Uh, we tend to avoid things that trigger us again. I don't really want to go near MRI machines again because they scare the heck out of me. Um, we have an exaggerated startle reflex. So people with post-traumatic stress disorder or stress disorders, if you sneak up on them and go, hello, they'll go, wah, and jump really quickly. And you think, wow, that's like a massive overreaction. But it's actually because their amygdala have been triggered and they have a, a much lower threshold for startling. We also see that the amygdala are much more active. And in fact, when you look at um, uh, scans of people's brains who've had post-traumatic stress, you'll see that you actually get amygdala hypertroph hypertrophy. People get larger amygdala because they've been working so much. Like the left ventricle gets hypertrophic in response to you know, increased afterload. If you have to keep pushing against it, then the muscle gets bigger. Well, in our brains, if we're constantly firing off this body of neurons, then they actually do get a little bit larger. So what happens in stress disorders? So in that case, if we've been really stressed by something, the amygdala is going to latch onto those and form a connection and be much more easily triggered by the sights or the sounds or the smell or the feelings of what happened at the time. Uh, if we come in contact with those things again, the amygdala will fire off much more quickly in preparing the body. So that's why we have hypervigilance. Uh, people who have post-traumatic stress are constantly on edge, or acute stress. They're constantly on edge looking for the next threat. Uh, if that happens too much, as you can imagine, it's very difficult for us to come down, to relax. And we need that balance. We need time to have our parasympathetic nervous system, our relax or rest and digest nervous system take over so that we can heal, so that we can sleep, so that we can, uh, you know, um, create new neurotransmitters that have been used up. So if we're constantly aroused in this hyperarousal state, it's exhausting, and we start to physiologically wear out. The hippocampus, on the other way, on the other hand, uh, helps balance off what's going on in the amygdala. So it's really important in memory formation. It creates and it stores the memories, it retrieves the memories, and it can calm the amygdala alarm circuit. So if you look at someone and you're going, ah, and then you suddenly realize, oh, this is someone who's safe and someone I love and it's okay, I got a hug coming, not a punch coming, then it's the hippocampus that will actually start to calm down that alarm circuit of the amygdala. So if you have post-traumatic stress, what happens? Well, it's difficult for us to recall things. So a lot of the memories that we have stored in the hippocampus 
uh, aren't very well recallable. So we get confusion, we get disorientation. We can also have these recurring thoughts, nightmares or flashbacks, as we pull things out of the memory of the amygdala, or of the hippocampus. Again, uh, difficulty sleeping uh, because of the hyperarousal. And we also see when we do brain scans that the hippocampus is actually shrunk. So we get hippocampal hypotrophy and it actually gets smaller, whereas the amygdala gets bigger. So if you imagine thinking back in the car, Amy gets bigger and stronger and louder and the hippo in the back just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks because it can't control Amy anymore. She's gotten out of control. So in PTSD, the hippocampus, which recalls memories, uh, uh, brings up those memories. Its job is to tell Amy what's going on. But if there is something that's legitimately stressful and scary that has happened to you, the hippocampus is going to help to trigger the amygdala to keep it hypervigilant for these sorts of things. So it turns into kind of an evil hippo of bringing up images that are difficult for us and arousing and frightening. Uh, they tend to be pretty strong, and we can see that the hippocampus does seem to be overactive in post-traumatic stress. And so we get flashbacks and nightmares. And with flashbacks and nightmares, it's very difficult to sleep. And this uh, lack of sleep and exhaustion is a part of post-traumatic stress. Uh, and the reason that the hippocampus turns into an evil hippocampus is because the hippo is starting to say, yeah, you know what, that thing that you're looking at, I actually think that that is a legitimate danger, which of course just freaks Amy out even more. So you get this, you know, building up cycle that they they sort of work together to get us into this hypoarousal state, hyperarousal. So the frontal lobe. This is uh, our executive reasoning center, and uh, it's the thing that we use to actually consciously think about stuff. If you want to think about, you know, what most makes us think of ourselves as us, what's my favorite shirt and stuff like that. A lot of that happens in the prefrontal cortex. So after a traumatic event, uh, what the prefrontal cortex should be able to do is to calm down our emotional center and uh, bring us back to a more sedate state. So you've had this thing of, you know, okay, uh, it's okay now, everything's fine, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And you're consciously telling your amygdala that everything's all right. However, when we have post-traumatic stress or stress disorder, we get irritable, we get withdrawal features, so numbing and avoidance, which we'll talk about a bit more later. And you guys have probably experienced this. If you've ever been really stressed, you'll realize that your ability to think kind of shuts down. Uh, when the amygdala is very stressed, it actually just says to the scientist beside it, just shut up, I don't want to hear from you, and ignores the scientist. And even if the scientist is saying, this is really bad, you're about to drive into a wall, or you're about to drive out of gas, the amygdala is like, just shut up, or... Yeah, Amy's just saying, just shut up, I need to focus. And we've had this experience, if you've experienced like strong stress, of your, it, people describe it as my brain just shut down. It's not your entire brain that shuts down, it's just the frontal lobe that shuts down, the executive reasoning center. Your amygdala is still very much stimulated, but it's difficult to recall memories and it's difficult to form new memories, which is why after a really stressful event, it's difficult to remember what happened. Um, so that whole prefrontal cortex isn't being used as much. What happens in stress disorders? Well, this becomes uh, less active. Our executive reasoning uh, starts to shut down a little bit. So we have social withdrawal, we avoid memories or aren't able to recall memories very well, and we get this anhedonia, this sense of emotional numbing and not feeling our emotions very much. There's still a lot of activity going on, but it's it's in a way kind of shielded off from our uh, conscious thinking self because that part is pretty much shut down not entirely obviously but to to a significant extent so we can't override the hippocampus we can't override the amygdala the hippo and the amy are screaming in the car at each other going ah, 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 ah and the scientist is trying to go it's okay but nobody's listening to the scientist so what happens to our bodies we've talked a little bit about our mind and what happens in our our thought process in our brain, but what happens inside of our bodies? Well, our nervous system, first of all, is activated. The amygdala triggers the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight nervous system, and our bodies start to produce adrenaline and cortisol, which are really good in the short term, but not so great in the long term because they tend to wear us out. We tighten up, we have uh, tightness, we have this tension, and if we're chronically, you know, uh, all the time, that leads to headache, leads to soreness, leads to myalgia, muscle soreness, all that sort of stuff. 
the hyperventilation, and I've actually done another uh, lecture on YouTube here about hyperventilation. If we start to breathe, we start to throw off our pH balance and the calcium movement inside of our bodies, and we start to get tingling in our hands and our, our face and you know, start to do this. And uh, that can induce panic in some people, which of course makes them hyperventilate even more, so our respiratory system can be affected. We have cardiovascular stress, so we get hypertension, we get tachycardia. This can lead eventually into like an overuse syndrome and into eventual cardiac disease. And our endocrine system, the long-term effects of adrenaline and cortisol, they're damaging to the body. They tend to break our body down over time. They suppress our immune system. There's a whole bunch of effects by having these uh, think of it as jet fuel, you know, when we're really panicked, we pour this jet fuel into our blood and it's great in the short term, but in the long term, it starts to break our bodies down. And in the short term, when we're really stressed, our gastrointestinal system shuts down because our body says, let's not worry about, uh, you know, digesting food right now. We've got to stay alive. We can digest the food later. So immediately, as soon as our body shuts down, we start to have this feeling of nausea and discomfort and blah, in our stomach. People say I was sick to my stomach, right? I was so worried. I was sick to my stomach. Uh, or they, people say, pardon French, people say, no, I'm scared shitless. And that actually physiologically is true because if we're scared enough, our the, the nausea and discomfort in our body is so bad that we'll vomit and we'll defecate and it lightens us and it makes us less palatable to the drop kangaroo or drop bear that's attacking us. No drop kangaroos. I know. Drop bear or killer kangaroo. It's coming after us. Uh, so uh, we empty our ballast tanks and we make ourselves kind of distasteful. Uh, but in the long term, if we're chronically stressed, we can't digest our food properly. Our reproductive system shut down because, again, that's not mission critical for us staying alive in the short term. So all of the energy that would normally go into our reproductive system, the creation of sperm or a sense of libido and sexual excitement, it's all just shut down. And we just lose that. And over the long term, that can um, uh, shut down our system. So for example, women get amenorrhea when they're really stressed. They actually stop having their periods because their endocrine system is all sort of, you know, wiped out. So what does that do to our life? How does that affect us? Uh, let's talk about the effects of stress. So there's a whole bunch that start to come on. And there's lots of research that supports this, but we know we have sleep problems. We know we start to put on weight. We start to get into cardiovascular disease. We also know that the stress that we feel as paramedics will actually uh, start to come home and affect our spouses. It affects our family. And not only that, it affects our kids. It can even affect our unborn kids. Through epigenetics, the, the stress that we're experiencing makes us express different parts of our DNA. And if we conceive of a child when we're really stressed and those parts of our DNA have been expressed, then we can pass on the, the hyper arousal to stress to our kids. So uh, I guess anecdotally, I don't know if anyone's ever done this study, it'd be an interesting study, but I wouldn't be surprised if a study showed us that the children of paramedics and other emergency services personnel uh, tend to have more anxiety than people in the general population. We definitely know that the children of people who have stress disorders have uh, more difficulty with anxiety <clears throat> than people who have parents who do not have stress disorders. And there's, uh, there's research that shows that. There's also a lot of other things that happen if we're really stressed. It's not just that we feel a lot of anxiety. But if we have, you know, in the extreme case, for example, post-traumatic stress, then 71% of the people with post-traumatic stress also have some sort of substance abuse or dependency disorder. About half of them have a major depressive order. A little under a third have conduct disorder. There's social phobia. There's panic disorder. There's even mania. So PTSD usually is not just PTSD. There's a lot of comorbidity in PTSD, a lot of other things that go wrong as well. Next thing we'll talk about is paramedics and stress, and we'll put that into the next lecture.